And so we're very delighted to, that National Geographic has been an early partner with the GigaPan conference and through collaboration among the CMU's CREATE lab, National Geographic and NASA, the Global Connection Project was formed. As some of you may know, the Global Connection Project provides a whole new interactive way for people to learn about and meet their neighbors from across the globe. Educating people about distant places and cultures has been uh, a hallmark of National Geographic for more than a century. Uh, Mark Bauman, our speaker for tonight, is the Executive Vice President of National Geographic Television, and he is, uh, from his uh, time at National Geographic, enthusiastically embraced the potential of GigaPan to advance National Geographic's mission and has encouraged its use among their staff photographers. So CMU and National Geographic have long been at work improving cultural understanding and solving real problems through the power of new types of imaging. So we're very fortunate uh, to have him here to speak on a National Geographic and gigapixel imaging. Uh, Mark's work at National Geographic is the latest chapter in what has uh, been a esteemed career in journalism. Prior to joining National Geographic about 10 years ago, Mark was based in Eastern Europe and Latin America, where he ran Baghdad and Balkan coverage for ABC News. He's provided coverage of wars in Central Africa, Lebanon, Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Iraq for major media outlets, and outlets including ABC, BBC, CNN, NPR, and leading metropolitan newspapers across the U.S. and around the world. He's earned numerous awards and honors for broadcast and print journalism, including an Emmy Award. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for tonight, Mark Bowman. Wow. <laughs> uh, it's an honor to be here tonight and, and to be the warm-up band for the incredible array of speakers that Illa has lined up for you uh, across the next few days. I see a, a bunch of uh, events uh, that I wish I was going to be at tomorrow uh, and Saturday. Um, I've seen a lot of the incredibly cool things that people have done with GigaPan technology, so I don't kid myself. That, uh, that some of the stuff I'm about to offer you is new or revolutionary. But the thing I love about still photography is that it has the power to connect the head and the heart. And as I think most of you know, uh, GigaPan technology and the GigaPan interface sort of ramps up the tool set you've got available to you on, on both fronts. Uh, why is National Geographic interested? Uh, these are the things that we focus on lately and I think uh, it, it hits uh, on every major priority that we have as an institution. Geographic and global literacy, uh, media literacy, scientific literacy, and one of the things that I'm most excited about uh, recently is crowdsourced uh, science and citizen participation science. I, I think uh, that it's no secret that we've gone through a couple of periods recently where science has been devalued as part of the public debate and uh, I sure would like to see people connected to it more palpably. And I think this is one great technology uh, that's moving people in the right direction. Uh, we've worked with, with Illa and, and Dror uh, on a number of things uh, recently, but one of the things that I've enjoyed most is that uh, we've staged photo camps in, under, in underserved communities that focus on scientific and cultural literacy. And what surprised me about this technology, which is primary, primarily digital, is that it works for people on the wrong side of the digital divide. This photo you see right here uh, was taken uh, on an Indian reservation in South Dakota where they don't have much broadband. And these guys created post-it stickers so that they could start to meta-tag their community and areas inside their community uh, and start to learn about the power of photography and, and its ability to connect them to their own community. We're also using gigapixel imaging to allow the public to explore environments that you just can't see with your own two eyes. So let me see if this six-year-old laptop will get me back to where I need to go. Um, 
A couple of years ago, Mike Fay, who most of you have probably met, walked a transect from the southernmost redwood tree to the northernmost, a linear distance of 700 miles, although as Mike will probably tell you, he didn't walk it in a straight line. In 1850, old growth redwoods occupied two million acres of the California folks. But after a lot of people failed to strike it rich in the gold rush out there, they started logging the giant trees to, fill, to, to fuel the, the building boom out there. And by 1968, nearly 90% of the original redwood trees had been logged. National Geographic, Mike, Nick Nichols, his, his partner in crime, wanted people to think about these magnificent trees and how we could preserve and even expand their range. So as part of the article, that Mike wrote, Nick Nichols produced the first ever high definition seamless composite photograph of an, of an entire redwood tree. Now th this tree right here, 300 feet tall and somewhere between 1500 and 2000 years old. Nick believes, Nick believes that this could be the most complex architectural tree in the world. Uh, and you, you can't see it this way in nature. You can stand at the bottom and look up. Uh, if you were on a rope line, you could see little pieces of it. But essentially, what Nick had to do is, is, is create a four camera array and, 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 and drop it a few, three feet at a time and take 84 photos and put them together. Now, as, as you can see, we've got a really cool high resolution image of this tree, uh, which we hope will connect both hearts and minds but we have a really clumsy interface. And one of the things that we're talking about uh, doing is putting all of our gigapixel images into the Gigapan site. Because right now, well, I've, I've got it loaded up on this computer at, at pretty low resolution, but you can, you can dive into any piece of this tree you want. Look at the leaves. In a lot of these trees, the leaves that fall actually create mulch areas up high and other trees start to grow. I mean, there are frogs and, and, and ecosystems that exist in the canopy uh, that would be great for kids to experience. There are a whole lot of environments on the planet that you just uh, can't necessarily experience with the naked eye uh, or that you can't see fully from anywhere. Uh, a few years ago, Kenny Broad and Wes Skiles, who was one of the bravest underwater photographers in the world, wanted to share the dark and toxic blue hole environments of the Bahamas uh, with the broader public. And they, they knew that the most effective way to do that was with a gigapixel image. I mean, th these are caverns and, and uh, when you light a piece of them, you only see you know a, a few feet at a time. So Kenny spent a whole lot of time figuring out how to do this. And, uh, and then, I mean, this is one of the last photographs he ever took. So, here's a bit of the story behind it. And my goal was to capture an image that translates to the audience what it feels like to be down inside the earth. All underwater cave photography is hard. We have uh, no real communication to talk to people. We are 100% dependent on a very, very talented team to operate lights and strobes and perform complex and difficult diving maneuvers. This is a complex picture. I had to figure out a way to do a transect line that would allow me to keep the camera at the same depth and keep it at the same angle in a cave. I had to find this spot that I could do this. I took it as a series of photographs. Only the central corridor would be lit, and that above it would be black, and below it would be black. Wes took great risk in his photographs. The long, narrow composition, as he stitched picture after picture together so far to make this compelling image that captures 
the mystery, a assignment like this, my photo counts 34,000 photographs. A great photograph is pure magic, and it's amazing how seldom it actually occurs. I chose Wes Scott's picture because he takes us to a place we've never seen before. It's a celebration of the diversity of the world, and it's a celebration of exploration. So that Wes Skiles photo and the Nick Nichols photo uh, were, were both foldouts in our magazine, and people could hold them, experience them, uh, you know, in a tactile way. But uh, as more of our magazine subscribers migrate to platforms like the iPad, it's become critical that we offer them value-added experiences and richer ways to experience our photography, and and ways that they can engage in dialogue with it and around it. Uh, I think the sky's the limit on this stuff. I, I think there aren't people uh, out there, or there are very few people out there who don't want to participate in expeditions. Uh, I think we can use this technology to do species counts. Uh, one of my colleagues from uh, the camp we did 18 months ago uh, has been using it for bee counts. I know Mike's been thinking about using it for elephant counts along with satellite data. Uh, for archaeology and paleontology, it's an amazing technology, particularly with aerial platforms. And it, uh, the public uh, engagement piece is really what appeals to me. What we would like to see, uh, I mean, I think every year we're going to launch expeditions that, have, that allow the public to be virtual participants and help us find pyramid sites and then help us meta-tag well, start with the satellite data, identify the sites, and then meta tag uh, all of the artifacts in situ, in 3D. Uh, we'd love to create 3D environments uh, for exhibits that kids can walk through. I mean, that, that, that TUD interactive we, we've played with uh, in a star cave environment and, and, and done 3D versions of it. But you can imagine kids in inner city schools that can't afford to go to uh, a lot of the great sites on the planet, uh, being able to walk through them anyway, uh, being able to experience them online and, and, and to repeat the discoveries that we've all been part of, but more importantly, I think, to be part of the discoveries. I mean, the ability to meta-tag this stuff uh, and to capture more data than you can in a single photograph so that none of us, when we take a gigapan, are even aware of all that's there. Uh, opens up the opportunity for discovery, and that's what excites me. So we're, we've talked to NASA about crowdsourcing the exploration of galaxies, uh, but there's a lot on this planet still left to discover, and uh, for us anyway, gigapixel imaging and the Gigapan program are gonna be a big part of it, along with satellite imagery. So uh, I will not stand between you and uh, your wine any longer. Uh, but I'm happy to take a few questions if you'd like. We'd love to have some interactive discussion, so questions. So how are the rest of us get our hands on those coppers and those bluffs? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I mean, anybody can get a balloon. Um, it, they're not ideal. Uh, in terms of us being able to provide them in some sort of scalable way, we're, we're not there yet. Uh, but maybe in partnership with Illa and others, we will be. I mean, we're, we're, we're working, as, as are uh, a number of people, on underwater heads to do this. Uh, I'd love to have a reef environment that, that kids could meta-tag, uh, that the world could meta-tag and could watch through time, uh, through bleaching events and all of that. Uh, I wish there was a good answer to that question. I mean, I think it's all about being creative. That, that octocopter you see only costs a few thousand dollars and 
you know, you, you can buy a gimbal, you can start to play with it. That's what we're doing. Looking for things that are light and easy to deploy in the field and, and, and trying to make them work in different environments. Uh, we're building on that. Have you connected to the range community, you know, that are, like, let's say, publicly, publicly making available the spec for what you build so that others could think of it? No. Uh, you know, maybe we should at some point, uh, but most of what we do is based around scientific, cultural, uh, and environmental literacy, and you know, pu publishing uh, the tech specs of, of the uh, toys that we play with hasn't been core to what we do, uh, and some of it is just modifying off-the-shelf stuff anyway. So I'm not even sure that we've got the right to do that, uh, but it's definitely worth thinking about. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the 3D gigapic, uh, gigapans you've been working on, um, are they purely perceptive 3D, or does it actually um, create a model that can be used in other media? Um, so there are, uh, what, you can take the data and put it into a number of systems. So yes, it creates a, a model that you can play with in other systems, definitely. Uh, on the uh, stereoscopic optical pairs that you're generating from the uh, Hanukkah copter, are you using baseline imaging where you're putting the copter in two specific positions, or are you using local imaging so it's the right source? Of we're, we're, we're using, uh, you know, essentially two cameras with stereo separation. Pretty simple. You can do that with any gigapixel image. I mean, we used a robotic head and a camera. I mean, Illa can talk you through that, as can most of the people in the room. Uh, we used a robotic head to do a grid around the room, everywhere except where the photographer was standing, and then stitching software to put it all together. We need to stop the questions there because of the program that's ongoing, but Mark will be at the own gallery opening in a few minutes. So first of all, let's thank Mark for the time. Now red wine. We have a keynote gift for Mark. Um, unfortunately, one of our other keynote speakers is in the audience, so he's going to find out what his gift is. So, <laughs> Sorry, David. You're finding out early. We have a very, very thick, very dry, but fantastic book by Stefan Oderman about the history of the panorama as a mass medium device. Thank you. And that's been signed by everybody in the Create Lab. Thank you. And then we much. have the opposite end. We have Panorama, a fold-out book for children, which, when you fold it out, has a panorama 25 feet long in it. Wow. wow. So that's possibly the longest printed panorama you can buy in a bookstore. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. I've been playing with it with my kids. We have a couple of more orders of business here before we can open the gallery show. Um, I hope that the keynote presentation was a wonderful way to fill you with uh, some inspiration and some excitement about everything we're going to be talking about. I love having the interactive component at the end. We're going to make sure that the entire two and a half days is interactive like that. We're going to have a whole lot of discussions and mixing of ideas amongst all the participants, and the authors, the invited speakers, and the invited poster presenters. Now, in order to be able to go to the gallery, we need to recognize some of what makes it possible for us to have such a thing as the Fine International Conference and to have this wonderful gallery show. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be recognizing the wonderful uh, scientists whose photograph photographic representations have been recognized and chosen for the gallery, which you're going to see, and printed full size. Um, and yes, there's wine there too, and there's hors d'oeuvres as well. But we're really excited to introduce you to the scientists who won the uh, curated gallery competition and won a place in that gallery. But to do that, um, I've asked to have the honor of the presence of the Fines here. Um, now, all of you keep hearing me say the Fine Foundation, and so it's time to tell you a little bit more about that. The tripod that really made GigaPan possible was an initial collaboration 
between Google, National Geographic, and NASA. Uh, and it was really those three organizations that agreed to work with Carnegie Mellon to invent a whole new kind of technology. And we're always indebted to those organizations for that process. And in fact, uh, tomorrow, the speaker is Alan Eustace from Google, recognizing just as the day after tomorrow's keynote speaker is uh, from NASA, Dave Korsmeyer, that it is that tripod that makes all of this possible from a technological point of view. But technological funding has a limit, and that is the vision to fund new technology is a high-risk endeavor that we're very excited and thankful for, but there's a completely different kind of vision that we need in our society, and that is the vision to take new technology and take the risk of applying it in completely new ways for sociological good. That's something that's hard to do from the likes of a corporation, and that's something that we often turn to foundations for. So the pleasure that we have is in the relationship that we've been able to build over the last four years with the Fine Foundation. The Fine Foundation is the funder of the entire program of science outreach that Carnegie Mellon runs with GigaPan. It is that foundation that funds every workshop that we have run over the last four years. And the international conference this year is principally funded by them, together with some corporate sponsors that are on the program booklet. So it's really because of their vision and their willingness to invest in something that can have positive social good in the science community and in the science communication community that this whole thing can exist. It's sort of our raison d'etre to be here tonight is because of that. And in doing that, I want to recognize uh, two people that we're very close to at the Fine Foundation. First of all, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Sheila Fine, who's in the audience today. Um, Sheila has been a real champion and supporter throughout these years and has been really excited to see how you as scientists able to use gigapixel imaging. The handwritten notes that we've encouraged scientists to write have been read, uh, to write have been read by Sheila and Milt, and I'm very pleased to say that they're working. They gave us continued funding for this year, so that's good. <laughs> so keep writing those notes. <laughs> um, it is Sheila's compassion and empathy, her intellectual curiosity, and her desire to change the world for a positive, po in a positive way that have really made it possible for the Fine Foundation to have the vision to make this possible. At the same time, I also want to recognize Milt Fine. I'm actually introducing him because I'm going to ask Milt to join me here in front of the stage where we're going to give a bit of an award to each of the gallery, gallery uh, selectees. Um, let me introduce Milt first. Um, Milt's biography is long, and I've been trying to think of the right word to present this. The right way to present this to me is to say that he has been visionary both in the business world and in the philanthropic foundation world and in the trustee world of organizations like the Carnegie Museum of Art and the Andy Warhol community. He's on the board of trustees of many key organizations. He was a chair of the board for the Carnegie Museum of Art. He was also a founder and on the board of the Andy Warhol Museum, which is one of the most famous museums that we have here in Pittsburgh. Um, he is a chairman of the board of the Carnegie Museum of Art. He was, as I said, chairman of the board of the Carnegie Museum of Art. He's also chairman of the Fine Foundation itself, which is the organization that makes this conference and all the workshops possible. And I asked uh, Milt to come up to the stage and say a few words about uh, what they think of the entire Gigapixel for Science inquiry that we've led over the last few years. May I ask you to come up, Milt? I want to thank Ela for everything that he's done to put this program together. Uh, I enjoyed listening to the lecture. I have to say that I didn't understand one of the questions. <laughs> so even though the technology is beyond me, I am amazed and delighted with the results. It was a great pleasure to watch this. And I want to add my welcome to all of you. I know many of you who have come here to Pittsburgh uh, to be part of this conference. And I want to congratulate all of you for the wonderful work that you're doing. You know, when I first met Ela and listened to his plans and his hopes, I was intrigued by the idea of using a visual art form to facilitate important scientific work. 
And since then, GigaPen has become a much more familiar tool, really, around the world. Uh, for example, my daughter, Sybil, who lives in England, worked with ELA to organize a conference there uh, for European scientists to learn the technique that GigaPan makes possible. Running a foundation is very much like running a business in that you look to invest in projects that will have an impact, that are practical and doable. And one of the things that I particularly liked about GigaPan is that it tends to break down walls, walls between art and science, and walls separating the various scientific disciplines. As one who loves art, I'm intrigued that GigaPan is a technique which presents very beautiful and very stunning views of objects and life, and at the same time permits scientific observations and discoveries which otherwise would be very difficult or even impossible. The arts and the sciences both rely on imagination, creativity, innovation, and the marriage of these fields is in itself a very bold and daring venture, and it opens the door to other kinds of collaboration and sharing among the various areas of knowledge, exploration, and creativity. You know, in our society, we tend to become accustomed to separate silos and separate labels. We sometimes forget that our civilization advances the most when we share ideas and share concepts and tools from a variety of sources, familiar and unfamiliar. In academia and in business and in government, there of course are separate departments, agencies, institutions, each dealing with very separate and distinct subjects. And yet, as we live our lives, the lines between subjects frequently are very blurry and very indistinct. We gain very much from having a holistic approach to life, a big picture look, whether we're trying to solve problems or accomplish a mission. In the New York Times the other day, uh, David Brooks wrote a very interesting article, some of you may have seen it, about American exceptionalism. And I, I want to read a quote from that article. The main point in this composite story is that creativity is not a solitary process. It happens within networks. It happens when talented people get together, when idea systems and mentalities merge. Now having all of you here today from many different occupations, many different endeavors, is remarkable and it's constructive and it points the way to much greater achievement and progress. In, in my own work and in my business, I've never been a specialist. Of course, one needs specialties and specialists. But uh, I, there's very little specific that I can do, but I think I'm pretty good at doing things in general. <laughs> and actually, in our personal lives, and even in our business lives, we usually don't specialize. 
Life simply won't allow us to do that. We have to constantly deal with frustrations, feelings, emotions, challenges, failures, all sorts of issues. And to do this, we need to draw upon sometimes philosophy, psychology, economics, history, and many other fields. We need patience, we need resilience, and we need wisdom to navigate through life. So we have to graft all of those areas of knowledge onto our specialties. And while Gigapan presents amazingly clear and detailed images, the meaning of these images and their consequence is not always so clear. Being able to break out of our silos becomes a necessity. So I want to pay tribute to all of you for seizing this initiative and for being able to see what life through a much wider lens. And in this city where we pay some attention to football, I want to congratulate you for advancing the ball considerably. And again, I want to thank Ela for making this possible and for being a very multidimensional person who knows how to turn fuzzy images and dreams into very hard reality. So thank you again. So we're going to ask the uh, awardees to come up. I'll name them and perhaps uh, you can accept the certificate from Milt. We made panoramic aspect ratio certificates <laughs> since your images are all panoramic. And so first from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, uh, we have Eagle's Nest, which was taken in Saudi Arabia, which you'll see upstairs. And Richard Bryant was the photographer. He couldn't join us, so Chris Beard and Sandy Olson from the Museum of Natural History here will be uh, accepting his award on his behalf. The second one we have is, you're going to see a massive uh, ball of fish upstairs. The bait ball of Salima. And this was taken by Jason Buchheim, who's also in the audience. So the actual photographer is here in this case. Next, we have uh, photographers, both of whom are here. So we have two certificates for them. Um, this is the, entitled The Big Four, a sampling of the four mega diverse insect orders. You're going to see a whole lot of insects upstairs, <laughs> thanks to Andrew Deans and Matthew Bertrand. <laughs> Next we have an uh, amazing scanning electron microscope of a barnacle, a single barnacle made extremely large, much larger than any barnacle grows. And the picture was taken by Molly Gibson and accepting the award on her behalf is Jay Longson. Next, we have a very unusual picture. It's a picture of reality, except it can't be real reality. You're going to see a whole lot of hummingbirds, even though there's only usually two, on one uh, beautiful bergamo bush upstairs. And this was taken by Chris Fasti, who's in the audience here. We have three more. <laughs> we have uh, from Sierra de Enmedio, 
It's a picture that you will enjoy, and it was taken by Rudik List. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have yet another fine fellow. We can call them fine fellows when they are fine fellows and they're inductees of the fine program. Um, this is a picture by Dennis Van Engelsdorp and Michael Andre, if they would uh, both come up. And this is interesting because it's a picture of a giant panorama of an unhealthy bee frame from inside a beehive. That is the conclusion of the programming we're going to have in this room. I'm going to invite you now. Wow, we're 30 seconds late. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm going to invite you to the, yeah, <laughs> to the preview opening of the exhibit, which will be open to the public as of tomorrow morning. It's upstairs on the third floor. Am I right? Three? Yes. OK, I'm seeing shaking of heads. So go on upstairs to the third floor. There's hors d'oeuvres and drinks. And you can actually enjoy all of the giga panoramas up there. Thank you again for attending the very beginning of the class.